ads. Um, I, I'm not sure about those demographics who use that, but the World Mind, um, the what? Grandparents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, people's parents. Um, the World Mind actually has gotten a really great traction. Um, we've had several other news outlets pick up people's articles and then ask if they can republish them. And so oh, they've nice. been on, um, I can't remember the most recent, like different government websites actually have somehow found people's papers and then asked if they can have permission to republish it on their website. So that's happened. Okay. Um, so yeah, the world line is complete. It's just the worldline.org. And it's completely student run. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and the website's really awful right now. Um, <laughs> currently in the process of trying to make that better. So if you go it's, check it out. It's only a semester old, right? Yeah, yeah. The first issue was in February. Um, oh. Yeah. yeah. So this is this, this is, is, this is breaking. Oh okay, yeah. Breaking. Yeah, and all of us who kind of started it this past year were literally all abroad. Um, so now we're all back. So we're all on campus now. So we're going to really hit the ground running. Hopefully, um, you probably haven't heard of it, and I'm not surprised right. if you have it <laughs> because yeah, we've had three issues: February, April, and then in um, July, July first. So and for you, you know, the, I know you know my office, but the, some of the students who have. Than editors of these journals have been with national scholarships because yes. it's the, the leadership of the research journal becomes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the, yeah, the flip side is the publication stuff for sure, but what you're doing, what others have done in terms of organizing and running and being on review boards, that's also part of the whole undergraduate yeah. research experience. And so it's not just about um, publishing, but about, again, if you think of a resume line or a LinkedIn thing or whatever, that experience sets you apart from a crowd that has had all the same internships and the study abroad and all the other stuff mm -hmm. and, or lab experiences or whatever. So, yeah. Um, that. Yeah. And um, that would be, I mean, again, going back to the sciences, I, I've been found it it's really rewarding experience to I mean I'm learning how to build websites. Like I don't I didn't know how to code three months ago, but now I do. So it's kind of self it's completely student run and self started and so you don't have like a faculty person we have, kind of like Yeah, we have a faculty that. advisor, um Jim Clerk. Um but so he's kind of been pretty laid back and he just we kinda of asked for permission okay. for his advice on things. So you guys but really yeah, are sure. analyzing the Yeah, so we have we have some things but it's more <laughs> I feel like it's more to highlight faculty, right. and it's definitely more to highlight like faculty research, and it's more like, like the faculty member who runs it is doing a lot of the yeah. work himself. Yeah. Like I've only got emails from him. The oh, okay. catalyst, yeah. Like I've only ever got great. Yeah, it's great. But I only get emails from him, so it's not so. Yeah. It's one of those things you don't want to put more work on faculty, but if right. students are interested in doing it, you know. Yeah. He actually, he's like, this semester I really want to have um, you know more responsibilities. If you guys can find some for me. <laughs> oh, like, oh wow. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, um, so you know if, if you need me, but if not, right. so, maybe that's something we could talk about. Yeah, yeah, because like we could do yeah, like the CAS health sciences, like a science. Mm -hmm. like a science mm -hmm. But if it is policy related, yeah. <laughs> don't be a fucker. Sometimes I stretch, but yeah. My last conversation with the editors of Class and Clouds was that they wanted you know, CAS participation mm -hmm. and, and not have it be all SIS and SBA, um, and that would only be for the, the fields that are policy. Yeah, yeah, so there's a rich opportunity there. I want to throw out the, the one publication we often forget about is Pharmacon, which is the philosophy undergraduate research journal that is several years old um, and accepts not only um, AU students but students from other institutions. So Pharmacon's been kind of bumping along. It doesn't get the kind of press that I like to say this side. Yeah. <laughs> <But> <laughs> you know. <laughs> there you go. Going back to the starting point about getting you know students from other disciplines involved, I would also say that the, the presentation side of things, the, the rich network of symposia that often happen in the spring here in different schools, it, um, I know in the SAS one there's often public health projects. If it has anything in that, if the most tangential thing to do with international affairs, it's eligible for that kind of thing. And I'm sure when you think about the, the CAS or the SBA conferences, if there's a public policy dimension in the public health project, it's there. And those presentations are also maybe even more valuable for undergraduates, equally as valuable for sure, there's many more opportunities there when you have students who are doing things. say, okay, give it a shot at presenting it in poster format, in panel format, whatever. Um, so when do those occur? The so bias is in you know, late spring. Yeah. Yeah. So our students. Last week in March, um, typically, is the bias conference. Ours is usually late April. Yours is late April. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the date will be up on the website soon. Um, so yeah, so SPA has one, 
SAS has one, CAS has one, I mean, so SOC is that's a couple that for the top of that for the different disciplines and sites at SOC. And really that just becomes a, a I mean, I know from the back side of it, if you write a good abstract that appeals to what the conference is about, you can you can present your work there. It's not that you're vetted, what school are you in, do you get to present here or not, right? Um, so. Well, at CAS, they, they want you to have Okay, so I speak for the SAS. Yeah. Well. Okay. <laughs> the CAS, at least the old, I, have, I haven't looked at the rules recently, but back in the day, it was, you had to have at least hatched, you could be from another college, I mean, another school, but you had to have hatched the plan and that CAS okay. course. Yeah, so there's some variation. Kind of does it some kind of CAS? Oh, do you want me to bring that up? Yeah, you're bring it up. Yeah, you're bring it up. Sure. Oh, we're, we're live. Yeah. Excellent. So Good. how did you, I guess, yeah. you recommend, I guess, galvanizing students to say, hey, you should start. <laughs> Sorry, for a publication for the sciences, how would like you know, um, you just yeah? I guess I guess how did I guess start for you guys? Or? Um, <laughs> well, it was just like a group of of us. We were all just friends and had the idea to just do something like that. Because class and files is very formal research, and it's like a year of work kind of thing. Yeah. And then we were like, but there's no way. I wrote this awesome paper for class. And yeah. I'm a on it, but like you said, like, no one chooses only read it. Yeah. Like, so we kind of saw a need for a way to promote those papers that aren't as long. It's a cool luxury research project, um, but are still great and still people to read them. So I, I think I think since that's the way we saw the need for it, the best way to encourage students to start their own might be in class if a student writes a really well written paper that's well researched but is kind of shorter. I'm not really sure how but yeah, I know for public health I'm sure you have like research papers, smaller research papers. If someone does a really great one, maybe call them in like your office hours and say, look, I think you're a really great writer. Um, we don't have a place to like a platform for this right now, but would you be interested in starting one? So I think it would just be starting with the people who are naturally um, dedicated to their research and writing um, and kind of giving them the opportunity. I kind of think we get like that. <laughs> say, look, this would, this would probably get published if you we have the platform. Or I'm thinking of some of our students who have already conducted their own original research and are looking for places, a home for it, and right. you know, perhaps we could say start your own <laughs> yeah. Yeah. publication. Yeah, yeah. like the science and health. Yeah. Right. Questions about, I know you talked about you were saying questions about like kind of motivates when you're in labs and what you do in labs and that kind of thing. Yeah, so it really varies across the type of lab, like especially if you're looking at like an introductory yeah. lab, but, like inspiring them is kind of a whole different level versus somebody who's like their third or fourth lab they're taking. Like they can really like actually do like publishable research in some of these labs. And so I guess encouraging that would be the best way and then like once they get the experience like within your own lab of course then like they, they know what research really involves going forward they can decide if they actually want to join the lab in the future or even grad school based on that. I know a lot of like my interest in research stemmed from lab courses when I was an undergrad. So like promoting that and also like, encouraging like like you're saying with the writing, integrating that with the work that they're doing in the lab and then translating that into Eventually publishing it in the future. Yeah. Right. And then the students do get bit by the bug, right? Once they had a chance to present or to publish, if it um, feeds a desire, creates a desire to do more of it. Um, one of the things that I, the Matthias Conference tries to do is, is give prizes to sophomores and juniors um, so that faculty would be pushing. One of the problems that we used to face was that not enough faculty had to push their sophomores and juniors um, to present um, I don't, are, are you, How deeply are you reaching down in the SIS? But, meaning, like how early are, you, are you getting oh, sophomores presented? Yeah, yeah, so, yes, easily. The SIS Undergraduate Research Symposium is open to from freshman year to, to first year to senior year. We've had, in particular, for oh, example, the. Oh, I, I, CAS is open, but the population no. tends to skew old. Sure, sure. And we push, um, for example, what I was going to mention is the um, University College World Politics Program, right, which is our intro to IR course, but it's a full year kind of sequence, maybe more in-depth research. We, we reach out to them and say, okay, you've done something more than the, the typical first-year student. Present your work at the symposium, even though there's going to be capstone projects and folks coming back with their uh, you know, study abroad projects and whatnot. 
um, sophomores or second year students um, who have just completed the, the music methodology. So it's a great time to try your first presentation here, even though there's also going to be you know capstone projects, and you're going to see that where you could go with it, that variation. So we actually encourage that. So students early on in the process and say, okay, well, I've done this, but wow, gosh, look what I can do by the time I have three more years of this or something like that, um, as well as the, so I think it's still a little bit on balance towards um, more advanced students, but not at all, it's not a significant student. That's great. Yeah, I would say an SPA is a very similar thing. Yeah. Like, I know I was part of a group that we presented freshman year and we were in the same, like, Three seniors and their capstones. It's like okay, like obviously one like one of these went away, not us. But it was still like a really good experience of just seeing those presentations because your typical like presentation that you might see someone do in class is like stand up PowerPoint in five minutes and like cover a lot, but just seeing people like going back to for like fifteen minutes was a really good experience. Um, and so kind of having that like, background as a freshman, seeing like okay, this is what like, this is what it's about. Um, last year as a sophomore, I presented at two symposiums at AU, a local conference and a national conference, um, and different research projects for three of the four. And so just kind of seeing, like, taking that experience freshman year being exposed to it, and I mm -hmm. got the bug. Yeah. Um, and so then I spent pretty much my spring every weekend was at a different conference. So I was able to, like, translate that. You had a travel schedule. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> So I think one of the things you can do like in class, I mean some of the classes in it for the sciences, especially like for biology, like they're kind of more now more research based. So have you taught like one ten, two ten, or are you going to be? Yeah, or? so I, I was involved in the um like the non majors biology introductory lab. Yeah. And I, I also was involved in um, the behavioral neuroscience lab, which is like third and fourth year a lot of neuroscience majors. And it, it does vary a lot in what you can physically have time to do because you're you can delve more into like a detailed research project in one of those upper level classes and you should have time to have actually gather gather data in the lab and have them be able to write it up and it really does encourage them. But in the um introductory like general biology labs they have like they have started kind of encouraging them to present more in the lab and one of the things they did was um doing like a, a poster like mini conference within yeah. the lab itself. And like that could, it's like a great experience, especially for people who like haven't been to a conference before. It really translates well to them being able to do that like smoothly yeah. in the future. I was going to say that the when you're looking for ways to start these things, what we found is build it into the curriculum rather than try to layer it on top. So mm -hmm. everything that I just talked about, the symposium's been around for a while, but all the other stuff that we're doing in SAS started kind of there. Oh, let's do this in a class, and let's do this as a, okay, a group of classes. And so before you were at SS, we didn't have the big, huge you know, poster conferences. We had them just in a couple of individual classes, and then just for 206. And then it built out to a bigger year at 306, and it's grown like that because of the scaffolding into the curriculum. So when you can find places to do that symposium with one group, or with maybe you bring all the sections of an intro class together for a symposium or something like that, that is we found a better way to kind of plant that seed and, and keep people involved than trying to launch some big grand new thing and plop it on top of you know, the existing curriculum where it's another layer of stuff to do and things like that. Well, it's good for their own experience because they're actually presenting what they physically did in yeah. the lab, but it's also good for the other students to be able to ask them questions and interact and mm -hmm. kind of promote them to really like, think further through what they're actually doing with each other. Yes, absolutely. Best, it's the best kind of education, right? Because you, it's hands on and you're really testing yourself. Um, did you want to go over some of these points, Sarah? Did you, uh, so we have this, and we, we all just put together a couple of bullet points that we had all thought about. It's not necessarily a formal presentation. I don't know if, um, if anybody in particular wants to speak to any of the, the slides that we put together. I can click through them to whatever on demand one you want. Um, <laughs> just given that I think by the people who are here now, the first time I think everyone. It's on the dumb board with the first one for sure. So, um, um, let's see. I'm going to fast forward to the so we can show the, uh, the, the thing that's new. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. That's the best. Uh, so, this goes to some of the questions you were asking about how to hook up students to different opportunities. Okay. This yeah. is what Michael, what I mentioned earlier, Michael has been working on with a group of us yeah. um, from across the university. The, uh, and so, is that a live site? No, it's not. That's just a slot shot of the. Okay. Um, is it possible for me to get to the internet from here? It might be. Let's find out. Heavens to Betsy. Mm -hmm. I'm 
from somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. So already here, though, you see um, we're gonna there's gonna be listings of places for you know, to match up students. Mike will show in a second to find those kind of publications or presentation opportunities. We have some listed on our um, SIS website as, as well um, that I can point you to the URL. And many of those are some of the more general ones that, that, that Mary Margaret mentioned for conferences and presentations where we know it's open international studies, but it's open to other things. And so some of those listings are already out there. In terms of, if you just Google SIS undergraduate research, you'll find our pages. And this is the um, Center for Undergraduate Research, American University Center for Undergraduate Research, CFUR. Um, right. The more you Google it, the more it's going to show up in search. Okay. Uh, it's not live. <laughs> oh, it is live. Oh, it is live. Yeah. This is just a screenshot of it. Um, it the, uh, the site itself is live. Oh, I just oh, ready to okay. Okay. Show it. okay. I have it on this screen. Is there a reason it's not showing up on that screen? I figured that if I was moving things, you know, hmm. on, on here it was projecting. And so while we're doing that, I just have a question mm -hmm. about how you all are Maybe under the five. as a group. And you yeah, know, if I'm working with a talented biology major or a talented SIS major, um, do I send them exclusively to you, or would they also have opportunities yeah. through the Center for Undergraduate Research? So I was into the center, not not like us personally. Because yeah. um, so we're kind of more of like just kind of an advisory as we're putting all this together. So I would send them to the center. You know, so you said like if you have someone who's looking for research experience, either on or off campus, then I would send them here. Um, I'd also encourage them, of course, to talk to their faculty members or department. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's kind of how it's meant to be feeling, but. Um, we're trying to encourage people to kind of go yeah. here as well. Yeah, I'd say it's a bit of both because one thing we have found that is successful is having a point person who's family's question or comment earlier, you know, I've written this paper, what do I do with it now? I mean, if I didn't know clocks and clouds exist, who do I talk to? Well, in SIS, they come and talk to me because yeah. we have a point person who says, okay, I can refer you to the center, but also all these other things that we know um, for you, an SIS person, or you, whatever your, your major or your unit is. And I think that's really valuable to have some point of contact there. Because, I mean, I've had numerous students come through my door who didn't know those opportunities and wouldn't if we didn't have somebody, if you will, in house that's helping at least, you know, Marshall students and uh, to the various resources that are available. So I think both of those are important. Yeah. And so, as I said earlier, the coordination of all this is quite new. We've got, and Aaron, you've been in that position for three years? Four? Four. Four. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so SIS is, has. has has that great advantage of a whole bunch of students in one major, so you can <laughs> you can coordinate a lot. Mm -hmm. um, in CAS, it becomes much trickier when you've got 17 departments and God knows how many majors. Um, and then SPA has got three majors, is that right? Four? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and some of you all talk to each other. Um, so you know, one of the things that's here uh, and kind of front and center is that faculty have posted research positions um, for students in, and we're going to rephrase this because we found that some people are stumbling on it, um, that you know, if you're an accounting student, this one professor who's a physics professor yeah. thinks that an accounting student would be really useful um, to work with him um, on this lab so, or on, uh, on this opportunity. So he, you know, you click on it, you're able to find out more about the position um, and whether it's paid or not, and what skills he's required. Yeah, right? it's a deal. So because he needs somebody who understands totally corporate right. structures, that's why he's interested in an accounting major, even though he's a physics professor. Um, and how are they funding? So if it is funded, how are they? It depends. If, this goes through. This, no, this goes through like an outside grant. grant. Like an yeah. Grant. yeah. Right? He's got a national, national science, science foundation grant. grant or, or an IH grant or NASA but, grant. But one of the things we want to do um, is we want the center to fund some undergraduate research positions. Um, and we might be able to do that this year. Um, so, you know, chemistry, as, as it turns out, you know, a biologist is advertised for that one. Uh, but she thinks <laughs> she thinks those, bio, uh, those um, chemistry skills will be useful for her biology position. Um, so, you know, this, is, this list is a... Um, live list, ever growing, ever changing as faculty post positions. Um, and you know, you go to the link for posting a research position and there's the form. We may try to make it a very simple form for faculty to fill out. Um, the um, we try to create two different tracks, one for students 
um, and one for faculty. There are other things in the left nav bar, um, but you know, f for finding funding, right? That's that's important for students. But there's also, a, oops, I already clicked on it. So here are some funding opportunities um, with links, and and we talked about the publication, right? So share your work um, is a link for students. Um, and it mentions okay. Fox and Clouds. I have not put the world mind up on it yet, but I do have Paragon, so I'm feeling good about that. Um, the student, uh, is world mind on the student media hub? No, it's it's actually funded. It's Fox and Clouds mind. <laughs> so it's, okay. it'll be, um, I guess it's Provost, SIS. And no, oh, it's Dean's office from both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, go ahead. So, and then there's this link to, you know, pers um, publishing outside the university. So there's a link there to, um, I guess, under SIS's page, um, which we found helpful. And that's where we have a lot of other students. Um, but we'll, we'll add some more it's of our not, own links. I mean, it's still skews in international studies. Conferences? Are those, is there a section on conferences? For outside conferences, I should know the answer to that. <laughs> um, not here. Not here. We have if you hit, hit opportunities again. If you want, like, oh, just okay. that. Click that. Again. I'm trying to figure out why I'm um, that out there. I need to add that. Yeah. If you go to the right, here's some off-campus research positions. That again is the SIS page, but there is a big list of conferences there. Many of those are general conferences that we know undergraduates have been accepted to. There, oh, many so are this also. Is, this is your course. This is the SIS. This is yeah, your that's the SIS, SIS page. Just, just because we built that years ago, so it's linked in. And, and if we have more opportunities, it's, it's not all going to point uh -huh. to the center, will point to just SIS stuff. But right now, those are linked in because they're there. Because this, our, our, the center's page got launched last week, so we're still yes. we're still building it out. Yeah. <laughs> And we don't think of it as being complete at all. Uh, but yeah, and CAS has a, a great research page mm -hmm. uh, that I used to link to. I don't know whether I have it still linked. Anyway, yeah, so there's some still things. We do the off campus research position. All right, so those are some of the summer things. Uh, but also during the year. Um, all right, so I'm mean, moving back to the, the slides if I could yeah, I find them. Great. Um, other questions? I mean, I can usually, we have some more bullet points, but I don't know if you want to necessarily plan on lecturing to you about all of those. or other things from your perspective. I mean, you've heard a lot about what we're doing, I guess, now, so I don't know if uh, Emily, Mary, Margaret, you have some thoughts, questions, or ideas about how things have gone for you for the, from, the, from the student perspective. And I can put up the stuff that you had sent us about that somewhere here. I did um, just, I starred this, um, and just going off of what we just saw, the um, make sure they are invested in the projects and not just doing easy work. I, I put an immediate star by that one um, just because I, I, and I think it's great that it's paid, so if it is busy work and it's paying that staff, but at least they're, you know, not unpaid interns also doing busy work. Um, I guess just like, yeah, if you ever are looking for a student to do research with, um, yeah, make sure that they actually are doing something worthwhile and not just kind of Googling the things that, I don't know, I think that's really important. I, I've had friends who are like, yeah, I'm working with a professor. The semester and you say, oh, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, you know, I'm just combing, combing through databases for them, basically. So it's not really actually really invested in it, and it's not really cool for <laughs> the professor to ask them to do that, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think On the be, flip side, so actually I put yeah. that in, and the reason why I did was because, yeah. um, so I've had students where, you know, I had a student who was doing research with me, and then she's like, oh, I have to do this. Yeah, this is like my real job. Wait, my other job, which is like my real job. Mm -hmm. I was like, my, or like, she's like, oh, I mean, like my research. And I'm like, I thought my research was your research. So she was kind of being, I mean, I think she was kind of putting this so that she could have this list of, of, of jobs and research experiences that she yeah. had. But like, 
she wasn't that interested really in my okay, yeah. project, you know what I mean? It so was like, both sides right, so actually it was a public health student, so she had like another research thing that she was with on campus, mm -hmm. and she said, oh no, that's like my research. This is just like, the, I'm just running these PCRs for you as like your research. I'm like, oh no, I thought this was your research. So I think just kind of vetting the students to make sure that you know it's like their Yeah, and, and it was okay, but you know, it's definitely better if they feel like it's their research. So that was just, you know, that was my, <laughs> And I can see that if it's not their research, that. there's yeah. a, at least I hope um, a recognition that they're developing a skill that will be important to whatever kind of research they do want to do. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it, the public health student might not be working on biology for long. Yeah. Um, but it feels like she's picked up enough skills and, and whatever busy work you saw. Yeah, yeah. So I, it kind of caught me off guard. I didn't realize this was your research. I thought it was your research. Uh, and we have busy work stories that we should that yeah. should chase at us. That what? That should chase at us. Um, no. <laughs> I, hope, I mean, I hope you don't tell any dry cleaning stories. <laughs> no, none of those. No coffee grabbing. I don't think. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just. It's the same thing. Just anything. It's you can develop the skills and not be interested, or you can develop the school the skills and be interested. So. I think it's important. Well, and, kind of and the flip side of that also too is I think you know a lot of times students think like research. I want to get, you know, we have this big umbrella term. I want to be involved in research. Well, you're probably likely going to be in one involved in one aspect, one piece of a larger research mm -hmm. project. And yeah. sometimes it's not sexy, and sometimes it's tedious, and yeah. sometimes it's a very small part that contributes and leads to yeah. you know, the next part, and that you may not see, or maybe you will be able to see. But that's. The whole that's part of the process, and you'll be involved in one piece yeah. of that process. Um, and I think that that's a learning experience that's important and valuable for students too to realize that you know the publication part of it is the very, 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 very end of it. But there's a lot of grunt work. And yeah, yeah. Tedious yeah, work. I, I didn't mean to say that. Oh, well, I know, I know. Yeah, I, know I guess just work. having like yeah. Like saying that and advertising it correctly. Right. right. Well, and it's yeah. on the faculty member or whoever to right. also communicate like right. how yeah. this fits, right? How this piece fits into the larger piece that is making contribution and it is important. Right. I think this speaks to something that I mean we thought about a lot that we're still grappling with. We SAS can be more broadly on that some things with um job tokens and some things on mentoring about really defining mentor student roles and relationships for any given project not in general but this is this is how you fit into yeah. this project this is how we're going to work together this is why this is essential um, or important or whatever and that's always going to vary by my project and my student faculty member and that's something we think about having some resources mm -hmm. on on the center's page about that mm -hmm. you got a page on mentorship yeah so yeah. so I'm, I'm now excited for you to read it and tell me how long it is <laughs> <laughs> um, so being able to probe the students yeah you know, when you say you want to be involved in research there's you know literature review and there's you know yeah, learning I mean, what's been done before and there's data collection and there's data crunching and analysis and you know it's all there's part of it, yeah. writing which there's which piece of it do you the think database you want to be for, for every written article on this is a part of this it is process a part of it. Um, I don't know that anyone necessarily loves to do that, but, but that's part of the process as much as mm -hmm. you know. That, so it's data entry. Maybe yeah. that's interesting to one yeah. student yeah. to another, but so. being able to have that discussion. What do you mean when you say I want to be involved in yeah. research? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested if like AU is looking to like, expand any requirements for research for the undergrads. Or so we have like they're redoing the honors. Well, not redoing, we have redoing the honors, but they are doing a new honors in the major. Mm -hmm. um, and so different departments. I mean, some of it, a lot of it is like the incorporation of previous whatever they had honors in the major. But I know a lot of them. I think most of them are going to be centered on doing that. So students want to get honors in the major, but not like in the honors program, but just like you know after the fact, like after we've already been here and then decided like, the honors in the major. So have like that. Elective, if they choose to do honors, then they would have to. Right. Right. So it won't be like a requirement. I don't think for any. I don't know if any of the majors require research, but probably some of the. Oh, well, so we just we just had our honors in the major yeah. approved, and so there's a scholarly research project. Yeah. It's part of that, that they'll be working closely with the faculty mentor, and so right. that's website. Biology and neuroscience are the same thing. Yeah. Right. So. And the literature department for years has required every student to write a senior capstone that requires research. So one of the things about students being involved in research is that if it's tied to that, like tied to their captain, tied to the honors of the major, or they're getting paid, <laughs> that's probably the best way to have the students be motivated to do it. 
Right, yeah. and they rather than just have volunteering for a few hours a weekend. Like associated with the physical work we're doing in the yeah. research itself, they have an associated project that they are going to be submitting and everything. But I guess like if you're going to encourage students who don't have that like specific motivation of an honors project, like how can you do that without like, any sort of requirements like across all undergrad? Well, this I is mean, where SIS is. Unless going. they have an innate yeah. interest. Right. I mean, I, I think it does come down to, to, to each unit doing it, so I don't know that it's going to be an AU thing, but rather, you know, each school or unit or part of each school deciding, you know, I think that's why this is so important. What are the curricular pathways that work so you can integrate it into curriculum in your particular discipline of you know, history, literature, biology, whatever the case might be, because there's not a one-size-fits-all model for AU, per se. Um, I think that you know, within SIS, we absolutely have the requirements as part of our core required coursework for methodology as well as caption requirements and things like that. That's one way to do it. Um, we also have the honors in the major program that folks can elect into if they really like research and the Olson Scholars program at the software level if they, if they want to be in a research intensive methodology sequence. But those are things that um, I think work because they were designed with a particular field and discipline in mind and not, not kind of a blanket. One must do these things. That's largely why the or at least in part by the University Honors Program became honors in the majors. Um, so uh, I think that thinking about where that would work and how that would work you know, in, the, in the curricular pathways that you see would be a great way to get things started because then students are investing in it anyway and they're doing it as part of, of, as part of the coursework. It's not an add-on, but it's this is, this is how you do this major. Research is part of it. Or even with an individual classes, like mm -hmm. requiring like, classes to incorporate some element of research like, into mm -hmm. an individual course. Yeah. Like, for undergrads, that would be like, a great experience. Like, especially it would add up across all the classes. They would be really experienced with mm -hmm. research. So I mean, I mapped our SIS pathways here. These are all, this is from first to fourth year, the ways in which research runs in the curriculum. And there's a few things that I realized I left out here, but it starts already in a first year seminar course, which is a reading intensive and discussion intensive courses so students know how to engage with literature. Second year, there's two required courses on methods and methodology where, where students, I mean, they, it's difficult, it's hard, it's challenging, but you understand what it means to do research in international affairs. And then it opens up, and Emily can certainly speak to that, <laughs> it opens up literally a range of pathways. After that, students can do any one of the things as they go into the third year with different Thematic area courses, some require research, study abroad, merit awards, opportunities, or at least starting the process because often the application process for those things is research-based. Uh, independent study or mentored research, and then that opens up even more things in the fourth year from summer scholars type research to capstone courses that require research to more merit awards, opportunities. Honors, I didn't put it in here, but SIS honors in the major would be in those third and fourth years, and those are research opportunities, independent research. And then many of these things have within the curriculum associated you know, mini symposia or presentation sessions or something at the end of the year that allows students to share their work, maybe with just their, their group, like the honors program, or maybe with the larger community. So there are, it, it took time, but there are ways to build it into a curriculum um, that we found to be very successful because in, if, if all of this was outside of the curriculum, you wouldn't have time to do it or interest, right? Now, part of it is kind of forced upon students in, in, in saying, look, if you want to be an SIS major, you have to know how to do research in these particular fields and disciplines. That's what we do, and you can't be an SIS major and not do that. Okay, um, but once one's made that wager and decided, okay, I want to do that and I want to understand this field, then it does open up those kind of pathways. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly saw from the student yeah, perspective. That was really a It's kind of it's a full year of, of research, um, so it's kind of like the the net where people kind of leave SIS after the first semester if they don't if they realize they're not going to be into research because it's a huge component and it's an entire year. The, the first semester is the methods and methods, mm -hmm. methods and methodology, and in the second semester you actually complete a different project. Um, so it's a, it is a lot of work. I, I was pretty miserable my entire sophomore year to be honest, but because it was just so challenging. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad that, that was a requirement because now I've been on research and I've done all these other great opportunities because of that. But you're right, it opened all the other gates. Um, so you just kind of have to get through that and then it makes a lot more sense at the end. <laughs> so you were both summer scholars, right? Can you talk a little bit about that program? Um, yeah, so uh, every school has a one scholar that they 
fund. So we both got grants uh, through the university, and so uh, the applicant or like you have to submit submit a proposal for research. So like, what do you want to look at? Um, it's a pretty generic just research proposal that you submit to the vice provost's office like after spring break, and then uh, and then the vice provost's office picks one student per school. So what was your working process? Except for CAFs. Except for CAFs. Oh, because the artists. CAFs and artists and spellers. I guess that's our equivalent. Yeah. CAFs was four. CAFs had summer scholars and selection. Well, it's it's coming from the vice provost. Um, so the vice provost is giving eight grants, four to CAFs and then one to each of the other four schools. Yeah. The school selects their, <coughs> reviews and selects their, their applicants. And, and it's a project that is going to be implemented over the summer? Yeah, so you do the research. Tell us about your projects. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I looked at the National College Health Assessment, uh, the national data uh, over a seven year period. And so I had done this, I had done my capstone uh, in my sophomore year looking at AU data. And so I then wanted to look at the national sample. So that's like I kind of took what I learned in like a smaller scale project that I was required to do um, and then applied it to like what else, like there are, there are other things that I want to look at uh, using the national data. And so that's kind of what I wrote my proposal based on. Um, and the same the mentor, Professor Palmer and SPA, who I had for. Yeah, you apply with faculty mentor. Apply with a faculty mentor. Uh, so the same person was my capstone mentor, is also my mentor for this. Um, and so. Definitely everyone's like experience with it has been very different. Um, like Professor Palmer, regardless of whether or not she's been on campus all summer, uh, she, like I've been working in her office, and so everyone in like the Department of Public Administration and Policy, which is primarily like only grad students, um, all those professors who've been around all summer have helped me out in various aspects. And so I definitely learned a lot more stats and a lot more other things than I ever really thought I was going to learn. I was able to not only be mentored by like, directly Professor Palmer, but about eight other professors. Uh, so that's been a really good experience. And so now I'm writing up, in the process of writing up my paper. This, I think, this in the summer, like, eventually you have to turn the paper to the mm -hmm. vice provost's office. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, like, we did something, we gave you money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and they wrap them into being on panels like this. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. yeah. And then another component of the um, of the grant is you have to uh, present at one outside conference, mm -hmm. um, or they you don't I guess you don't have to. They recommend that you present at one outside conference, mm -hmm. and the um, I'll be presenting at the SIS yeah. um, symposium in the spring. Um, and then they also encourage you to submit uh, to a publication mm -hmm. to be published. Um, and so then, I guess my experience with the with the grant, um, the I, I hadn't heard of it, but a, a, the professor that I'm working with, he and I had already decided like a year ago that we wanted to do a project together, um, and then this came up, and we're like, oh, that'd be a perfect opportunity to do a project together. Um, so that's how I ended up applying, um, and I've been I mentioned before I've been researching the election um, and levels of xenophobia. Um, amongst anti-establishment followers, so Bernie and Trump supporters primarily. And um, I'm linking kind of the new thing that I'm trying to add is linking their origin story of American identity to levels of xenophobia. So kind of how they conceptualize American identity and how that may or may not correlate with xenophobic political tendencies. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I've been working on. And my mentor lives in Philly, and so he comes to DC occasionally for work. But so he's come down twice just to work with me, and then I've gone to Philly once to work with him. Um, so the grant funds it, it's a really great I mean, amount of money it pays for like to live here and for the summer, and it paid for you know travel to and from Philly um, or things like that. Yeah, so it's been really cool. And I'm um, I've also done all my data collection. I did online surveys, so I used. Um, I have a similar experience to Mary Margaret as far as getting to work with a large group of people who I didn't plan to be working with, um, primarily in the CTRL lab. I've gone to them a few times, um, so they've been really helpful uh, because I had originally planned to methodologically go an entirely different way, and then after learning about some of the software that we have here, I chose Qualtrics. 
So AU uh, Qualtrics hosted my survey, and then I used Amazon Mechanical Turk um, to put out the survey online so I could pay expense um, for, for completing the survey. So I got to meet lots of people who knew lots of things that I didn't know how to do, so that was fun. Um, so yeah, now I'm also ready to start writing my conclusions, um, but I'm struggling with SPSS right now, so Dr. Rosenecker is actually going to be helping me hopefully soon <laughs> to figure that out. Um, and I'm going to be looking at Linda on the AU portal mm -hmm. to learn how to do that as well. But so that's that's my experience, yeah. So, so Emily, so we we'll touched on a really important part, which is that this is for the, the research part of it. It's not for travel. We have grants for travel, mm -hmm. and it's not for conference presentation. We've got grants for that. This is for doing the conduct of the research. And, and you know, you can see there's a small stipend for the, the faculty manager as well. So actually, I had a student who did that. So I was going to say, since you're the program director, so I'm a term, or I was a term faculty, I was not, but I was a term faculty. So research is not part of my job per se. And certainly during the summer, I don't get paid to do it. I didn't get paid to do anything. So, um, so the first year, I kind of did a lot of work for free. I felt a little bit exploited. Um, so for the second year, I had a student who got this award, mm -hmm. and it worked out really well. So he was in a situation, and I think also something we didn't really talk about on here, but I think it is an issue, which is like students who need to work like for money in order to yeah. survive, essentially. And you know, my student needed to work for money during the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so he actually stayed home um, in Harrisburg, and he got the award, uh, but it did allow him to not be a waiter 60 hours a week. And so he really did put in 30 plus hours a week working on the research and it allowed him to do that. Um, and then we had all of our meetings over FaceTime. So we'd meet over FaceTime two times a week, which is good for me because then again, I could still be at home, but I'm still working. You know, and with the stipend, I felt like that was a fair mm -hmm. compensation for, for my part of it mentoring him. So it worked out really well. So I definitely would encourage term faculty to get students that apply for this because this is a good way to, that they can do this and not feel like. Why am I doing all this extra? I mean, you might want to do research, but at the same time, it is it is work mm -hmm. for for you know. I mean, if you're not, if it's not part of your year, if it's not part of your tenure, then there's like why am I doing this? This is, this is good. Yeah. Yeah. Really the only shame is there's so few of them, right? Right. Yeah. And what I'm mean, people are working on and thinking about yeah. is ways to support yeah. on yeah. a smaller scale mm -hmm. more of these things because yeah. I think we've seen a demand from an increase in demand from students, especially saying, okay, now during the summer when I don't have classes, mm -hmm. I have this project. I'd love to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not everybody needs full full summer kind of support. Mm -hmm. So you know, in that case, some might be able to do you know project as part of the summer. And I'd love to find you know, resources were no issue. We had many many more of these. But um, yeah. and so if CAS has a summer research yeah. fellowship and that has an academic year mm -hmm. fellowship. Um, those so things used to be all linked to my old site. I haven't put the links okay. on the site yet. Well, but I know. Yeah. And I know. I mean, so many high quality applications yeah. that that we read. Last year, this year, mm -hmm. um, last year we had a student do you know research on refugees, ethnographic field work, and just fantastic got published. Um, so you read these things, and you'd love to be able to award all of them because the proposal process is it's, it's real. It's, it's like writing a grant. You've got a budget, a timeline, a description, mm -hmm. a review, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are really high quality projects, you see these students have gotten it through coursework and mentoring that they mm -hmm. they know what they're they're after. The other thing is. I don't know if you guys took advantage of the housing at all this summer, or uh, any students were able to take advantage of the housing. So one of the problems things we struggled with in the past was <coughs> housing, and that they didn't have dorms open on campus during the summer, but now they are. Yes, that's right. So coming, coming now. Coming now, yeah. So I mean, we're they announced it last summer, yeah. but we found out very late. Yeah, so I can see one already made arrangements. But yeah, now students will be able to stay over the summer, and they can choose which days and which weeks. And so they can pay weekly yeah, for yeah. some more. Yeah. 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 Paul, you were going to say something. You were going to ask something. Oh, I was just going to ask you how much time you invested in developing your proposals and what support you had from faculty along the way. Because you know my model is three months <laughs> and 20 <laughs> drafts. So, <laughs> um, a while. <laughs> a while for what me. would you tell your fellow students if they asked you about preparing to do it, one of these applications? So, I that's a tough one because I think so. How I, I how I work is I will just do 
I will just brood and do nothing but think about it and literally not even touch my computer and I'll just brood and brood and brood. So I probably like thought about it for about two months and just didn't make any physical progress and then just wrote it all in like two days. <laughs> so I just kind of, I just work like manically, I guess. So I don't know like if other people were like to organize it out, my like manic stage probably would be about three, two or three months, um, but I did it in like two days, but that isn't to say that, I mean, it was literally all I thought about. <laughs> um, and as far as support, um, Dr. Mislin and I emailed back and forth from like late December until I submitted the thing. Um, going back and forth, changing the topic and changing the methodology and because it actually transformed so much because um, I knew I wanted to apply and we knew we wanted to work together and my original idea was um, polit it's like political violence with refugees and, and that was my that was my proposal so I had one proposal and then we both realized we're like this is not really unique other people have already done this and then I was like, okay, well, <laughs> there goes my entire, you know, last month of work. process. Right, and so it went from political violence and refugees to Donald Trump supporters. So there was, I mean, literally nothing there is related at all. So I think that process kind of, he and I, he kind of equally were like, well, I don't want to do this, but I do want to do this. And I definitely want to make sure that I do interviews. And now I'm not even doing interviews. So um, that back and forth was like late December till whenever it was due. March, yeah, March -ish. So a couple of months of figuring that out, um, and then actually writing it took like maybe two straight. And I was abroad whenever all this was happening, so I had a lot more time than I would at AU. Um, and because my class, I only had class like twice a week, and I had no clubs. <laughs> you know, my life there was a lot calmer. So I think that's another. And I think you were at AU trying to actually plan for this and have a successful application. You would want to plan a lot better and budget maybe three months to do that. Yeah, I, or, so my project is basically a like expansion of what I looked at on my, with my capstone uh, and looking just like with the national data sample instead of just one school. Um, and so when I had been doing my capstone, I had kind of figured out like these are some other things that I would like to look at to see if like this holds up against, like is AU actually this bad is, or is like this the world? Um, and so I had kind of already thought about some of those questions, uh, but then when like the application came out, I probably wrote it in like a week. Uh, my professor Palmer looked over it a couple times, made some suggestions, uh, but I don't know. I more it didn't. I didn't think it was that difficult of a proposal to do. I was also coming off writing a 60-page capstone, so <laughs> everything was a little like compared to that, things weren't as bad. But you know, I. Definitely, like the more time you spend, the better. But it's also how much time you spend. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, and I, I just thought of another. What Professor Rosenberg mentioned one of the components is a literature, full literature review. I guess it's yeah. There's a couple of pages um, with at least like, at least one page of sources mm -hmm. up for the literature review. So that is the part where I lean the most on um, my mentor to help me figure out what literature I should look at. Um, before sending in this proposal, so I think that was the most, um, like the most collaborative part of it, because he is, has a PhD in the subject, and then I'm just I've read whatever I've had to read for classes essentially, and then my own interests. So that was that is I think the hardest part, and where the mentor comes in the most um, at, at the very beginning. So that's kind of their first, I think, biggest role, at least in my experience, because they can recommend what you should read before you propose on something. So that was helpful. And Riley, I have a question for you since you're here um, with PhD students, um, especially in the sciences, but how much do you interact with the undergraduate student research in your lab? Like, I mean, is it like a tiered, like, you know, Vicky to like grad students to undergrads, or like, is it more like, um, yeah? Well, the, the way that our lab does it is kind of more specialized, where like each individual kind of has authority for their own individual project, and they consult with our advisor, and like, they really develop their own kind of focus but I mean there's there's some interaction with like support with techniques and learning like the initial learning curve but then they actually kind of take on more of a so you undergraduates more do their archives they're not like helping necessarily you yeah they, they do have like their own individual um projects sometimes it can be something like our lab has worked on in the past and then they go off on like an avenue to investigate that further okay. but it really is like their own 
work that they're they're focused on. Sometimes, like in other situations, they might be interested in helping with um, a graduate student's research project. So it kind of varies depending on their interest, their experience. Um, what you were saying about like all the work involved with the um, grant writing process, I think a lot of students don't have like background in, in grant writing at the undergrad level, and it's a really important skill to develop, especially if you want to go to graduate school. And like I guess that could be part of the the coursework where they could have even just like mock grant proposals where they have to develop the skills within the class. Sure. Some courses do. Yeah, I know that we have some. Yeah. And I know. I mean, that that again goes back to why the mentoring component of this is so important. I mean, when I review the with a committee the proposals for something like this or for other things that are like this, you can, part of selecting the students for that, you can see that the ones that rise to the top are the ones that have vested time in, in building a mentoring relationship. Because there's a clear difference between you know, your proposals and the ones where a student wrote an idea, a faculty member wrote a rec letter, and it's clear that the two hadn't been talking about the project. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, yeah, we can do some of that in classes, but a lot of that comes out of, again, building that mentoring relationship with faculty who you get to know early in the curriculum and then start to work with over time because that's where, again, they're imparting skills that are unique to their position, having a PhD, that you, you wouldn't have encountered yet, right? Um, and so I do know it's built into some of our courses, um, in particular in, in some of the upper level courses in our thematic areas that it might involve that kind of work in public policy. But, um, but there's also the, the idea that this is where students really need to remember to build mentoring relationships early. Um, so they can draw on that expertise because not everything needs to should be funneled through a class or an assignment, but it's also about building those relationships. So I think there's two parts of it, right? It is a very important skill, absolutely. Do you all send feedback to the failed proposal? When? No, no, <laughs> no. Um, we haven't. I mean, sometimes students will come in mass, um, right. but we haven't done a, a thorough write up. We send feedback to the successful proposals. I mean, because actually reading these proposals, <laughs> it, it was one of my most exciting and yeah. fun meetings that I've had to read through the proposals for this. And we just sat with a group of faculty members and we're just like, oh, so-and-so could do this, and what about this? And we could add on this and suggest that. And then, you know, and then of course you end up going in, in, in some directions that you, you know, are different yeah. anyway. Um, so we do a lot of that and it's really cool because we sit around and say, well, look at all these things that you know, the student and the mentor are, are on to something really cool here. And then we, we brainstorm about that. So we, we did it more in that direction. Um, so, and I also you know, say in my experience, like, Having like Professor Palmer as my mentor has been really helpful. Also, like scaling back the project a yeah, bit yeah. times too. Because I got down this whole rabbit hole of like, I want to do structural equation modeling and like match it to this other data set. And she's like, like you're not going to be able to get that done this summer. Um, and so, and just like kind of hearing back some of those things and other things of like, like I have a PhD and I don't know how to do that. So like, you know, we're going to find someone else like who also has a PhD and could explain it to you. Or like maybe you shouldn't be doing that because we're an undergrad. And so like yeah. maybe you could do this technique instead. So yes. also or just scope of project. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I see things, of not just for this, come across my desk that would take five years to complete. And it's easy to understand why this is again goes to the mentoring and working faculty relationship. A student not having done much research will think, oh well, it has to be big to be viable, and it has to be huge, and it has to you know have all these things. And of course, you don't have an appreciation for the time it takes because you haven't done it. But students who work with faculty will get that advice and say, no, actually scaling back and focusing and making it feasible is going to be much more you know, viable <laughs> yeah. and, and, and a better product at the end. So I did the exact same thing. Like I wanted 20 moving parts and mm -hmm. I, I had all these different theories already written up about how we could figure it all out. And Professor Mason was like, all right, just just step back for a second. And we're like on the phone, like, okay. He's like, so what is the greatest invention of all time? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know, Dave. What is it? He's like kitchen egg mixer. <laughs> like, excuse me. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, because the the engine in that thing is just so simple, you know. And I'm like, what? Never opened it up. I have no idea. Yeah. Like, I need to practice. Yeah. And then what is what's like the rifle? They could like bury. Well, you know, do you know what I'm talking? They have like some rifle where you can bury it and you can dig it up in case the revolution happened. It's, I don't know. Then he also compared it to that. And I'm like, I, what are you actually trying to tell me here? And it's, yeah, it's just the, 
needs to be like one thing. <laughs> so yeah. that was his roundabout analogy to say this yeah. scope, scope and bound. Yeah. 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 The professors and those students. I feel like it could be expanded more, like among students, like students who don't have any experience and students who do, mm -hmm. like get them to like share like what that experience has been like, so that if they get to know like what's really involved, because it's kind of like this vague, weird yeah. world of like research. If you don't know what it is, and, like, maybe you would consider it if you have that more background. I think what we could do is we can kind of encourage students to go to these like you know yeah. sort of specific symposia. We get help. We have quite a few students that have revised classes last year, but we could definitely make it more of like I mean, bonus points or prop yeah. points or you know, just let students know that they should go. Sure. And see what you know, what what you could be doing next year, you know, if you want to do it Because it is like having class requirement for yeah. some classes. To it's not to hard. participate, but to it's hard because you observe. have the students who have to like work or they're doing yeah. internships and hard to like. It's often an extra credit. You have to be here this day. Yeah. And they're like, but I can't. Yeah. yeah. So it's oftentimes the yeah. space here. If we can only schedule yeah. these things when you know students have classes. But it's yeah. often an extra credit for my research classes. You know, go, okay. go and yeah. ask a question. Don't just go or go and write up a yeah. you know, thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, don't just go and sit there. You don't get extra credit for that. Yeah. But um, but that kind of thing. Because this is also where, whether you're presenting or students early on, they see these other projects. And on the one hand, they say, wow, look where I can go. But if they talk to that person, they'll say, well, look, this started out as a huge thing, and I did all these things to narrow it down, and here's the steps, and they get a better appreciation of that process. It, you know, it doesn't just fall fully completed from, from the sky, much as we might like it. So, um, I'm wondering what kind of harsh words you all have for us. Are there like mistakes? That you, that you hear faculty making, or are there ways in which faculty are letting talented students like yourself down, not you in particular, but maybe things that you've heard? Are there, are you, is there advice and wisdom that you have of things that you, you've either experienced or heard other students talk about? I would say that this is going to become the lane criticism or whatever. But like CTRL and just like the help that the library can be is not talked up enough. Like it's like the first time I, I went into CTRL I was really like kind of scared, very confused. Like saw it existed because my stats class was next to it, but like had a you know, professor had ever talked about it really. And so like they're a fantastic resource for students and are like more than willing to help. Uh, and the same with like every school's a librarian and they're here for students. Yeah, right. and the movies are like right and like they're they're like more than willing for like to help students out with their research and not just like how do I cite this obscure table, but also like I need help finding sources or just like what are some other similar studies done these kinds of that. So like definitely those like made some like either like went in and talked to people was like, ah I'm kinda of scared, what am I doing? Uh, and people I don't think they're really talked up and not in classes. Um, I'm still trying to think of one. Um, I, yeah, maybe similar, uh, not talking up the opportunities for publishing that we have, um, not talking up what conferences AU students have been successfully or have, have they've been accepted to in the past. And I think this website is a great resource because maybe professors just don't realize, they don't know them either. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I guess. Just ad more advertising, kind of marketing the opportunities that we have. Um, they don't do that much, very much at all. Yeah, and I've—I mean, I only knew about summer scholars because of Professor Mislin, and I had him in a class. The only reason we really it's so like you can it all dominoes, you know, back to like one day we start chatting. But if, if you don't get lucky with a mentor like that, then I wouldn't have been in Olson Scholars, um, so I wouldn't have met Professor Rodenecker. So it kind of. It all, I think, stems from one getting to know one professor. But if you're shy or you don't really know a professor, or you haven't exactly worked with one yet, then you can at least know about the opportunities from 
from your classes because um, you have to go to class. So <laughs> yeah. that, that's a great captive audience to tell them about these opportunities. So we should be promoting more clients. Yeah, I think so. not like day. constantly, but yeah. yeah, like the beginning of the year, just and maybe if if you have like a big project due and maybe you could remind them, there's this website, here's all the information. Yeah. Just yeah, throughout the year, maybe a few times, or if there's like the conference coming up, um, the deadline is approaching, you can remind them things like that. Via email, even you know, just telling them. Yeah, I know there's a there's an information overload side to it too because um, you know I'm the, I, I write these things for the, the newsletter that goes out, the Facebook page and stuff like that, and then I'll still great. yeah, and then I'll still hear you know, and, and I don't I don't blame them. I'll still hear from students. Oh, I didn't I didn't know about that because you get so many emails, right? And there's so many pages to check or websites to examine. So you know, anyways, there any suggestions in being able to better add on to all those things that we're already doing the messages and stuff. I mean, in faculty, I tell them, promote these in the classroom and then if they're busy and they forget and stuff right. like that. But I think absolutely we found, again, when you, you have a captive audience in a yeah, classroom. Yeah, and so when you can, in person and is and the best. If it, even if it's only the one student in the class that's like, oh, that's the opportunity for me, fine. Then you capture that person, they've got the bug where they otherwise might not have. So, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, we just, we are struggling with how do we get all this information out because we have it all, and, and then we all get thousands of emails, yeah. thousands of websites. I always read the, the newsletter, but <laughs> <laughs> I recognize it. But, but I get that everyone does, because yeah. I don't read every newsletter that comes into my inbox. Yeah. I mean, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I think or promoter for I mean, I feel like yeah. as a faculty member, I get too many promotional opportunities. Yeah. Uh, push your student for this um, competition or this conference or this one. Right. It's too much. Um, but then you find but to Emily's point though, it's also, I mean, it's, it's so huge for students, especially ones that are interested in these kind of things, to force themselves to build relationships with faculty members as sometimes difficult as we can be to reach or find or curmudgeonly or whatever. Um, you do that and then you have a, a personal connection, right? I mean, because many of the stories here come out of, this came from somebody I met early on who then became a mentor, um, which is really important. I mean, and that can just come from office hours and stuff. Yeah. Or or through a TA who was a faculty member who built it that you know um, that way as well. And many of our Olson scholars first know about that program through the World Politics TA who then says, hey this this student has a lot of potential in their first year because I'm TA and then this intro course. Why don't you ask them about being part of this program or that research project? So yeah. that's where that relationship can be very important as well. And I mean even like outside of the major, I mean, I, Dr. Ransom knows I'm publishing a book <laughs> this fall with a professor in SPA, and I'm not even in SPA, but we just bought in really well, like, great in class, and now he's publishing a book of my poetry, <laughs> so that was cool, um, but that was a all. Blurb. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, Professor um, Dr. Ransom wrote a blurb for it, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, I think, maybe just, if you like a student, just like, <laughs> you can approach them too, maybe, because that's what happened. With um, Dr. Johnson in that that case, um, just because he liked the poem I wrote for class, and then he like emailed me and said, "Hey, come see me." So that's how that happened. So mentor, mentoring. Yeah. Other other burning last minute thoughts? Yeah. 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 Yeah.